Hello, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the museum's director, Mickey Garcia, and our Creative Impact Board, I welcome you to this program this evening um, for the ASU Art Museum. This program is Luster and Light Conversation, Artist Relationship to Material and Value. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Sarah Kelly, Wingate Curator of Contemporary Craft and Design. Um, her position is a temporary position at the museum, which has been quite intensive and it's been such a joy to work with her. Um, but this conversation is going to allow us to dig deeper and really talk about some of the themes she presented um, in the um, exhibition and talk with three of the artists who participated in the exhibition. So the format of the talk is I'm going to hand it over to Sarah in just a second. She's going to do a little brief introduction. And then after her brief introduction, um, then uh, she will be um, having a conversation with our artists. And at the very end, we have opportunity for a Q&A. So Sarah, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Great. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, can everyone see? Oops. All right, well, welcome. Thank you, Andrea, for the introduction. Um, and also for to Sam Frescas, Marino Mateo Laca, and Lauren Common for joining us tonight. Uh, Mary Beth Bisgen is also behind the scenes tonight assisting us. Um, so I've asked these artists to join us because their works are both the most recent works produced in Luster and Light as most works are in our permanent collections and have been for at least a little while. And also I feel like in some ways their work addresses the themes of the exhibition in the most direct and intentional ways. And I'm super excited to hear their thoughts. So we'll get to all of that in just a bit, um, but I thought it would be really helpful for any of our audience members who have not been able to attend the exhibition in person, um, if I do a quick walkthrough of this space. Um, so I'll introduce the exhibition and some of the themes addressed, and then I'll let the artist speak to their own work. So to really briefly introduce myself, uh, my name is Sarah Kelly again, and I was the primary curator of Luster and Light, um, though I had, of course, the wonderful mentorship of Mary Beth and as well as Heather Lineberry. And this is the exhibition that really will ground our conversation this evening that Lauren, Sam, and Maren have so graciously agreed to be part of. I am the Wingate Curator of Contemporary Craft and Design at the ASU Art Museum. This is a short-term fellowship, as Andrea said, um, funded by the Wingate Foundation. And it was created with the intention of highlighting and really thinking through how and why and which kinds of craft and design will be part of curatorial and collections processes in art museums moving forward. So this is something I really try to make part of all exhibitions I work on. Um, basically finding some way, even if it's not a focal point of a show, to consider how we think about and utilize craft. I'm sadly nearing the end of my 18 months with ASU, so I'm especially glad that you're all joining us tonight. So let's take a look at the show quickly, and then of course we can hear from the artists. So Luster and Light is currently on view at the Ceramics Research Center, which is part of the ASU Art Museum for anyone who's unfamiliar. Um, and for anyone local who hasn't yet had the chance but would like to see the show, it is up until May 15th, so you still have a bit of time. Okay, cool. There we go. So Luster and Light addresses the idea of value, the idea that value is created through social means that we're taught what to value by society by our schools, our parents, by social media, the TV shows we choose to watch. Um, humans are deciding what has value and what doesn't based on many variables. And I always think it's really important to ask who decides? How did they come into a position of authority? And is it an obvious position of power? So a great example, of course, is an exhibition. Who gets to decide what artworks in a muse museum collection go on display and why? So I wanted to think about where the art museum stands as an authority figure and deciding about what has value and what doesn't in the art world and beyond. What role do museums play in determining the value of an artwork? And how do we uphold the decisions made by others in power, like curators, like art historians and critics, gallerists, auction houses, people that donate work to museums? And where does an artist's work and voice sit in this conversation? And of course, what social impact does this authority have on visitors who experience the museum? 
So luster and light utilizes the idea of luminosity or luster as a symbol for value. I decided it was important then to ask what kinds of value are we talking about? There's a lot of room for interpretation there. So I'm going to talk about a few specific ideas. There's monetary or market value. How much does something cost and why? What's the history of there? And what's the relationship to an institution then like a museum? Something can also have emotional value um, or our attachment to something because of a memory or a person or association. And then there's also social and cultural value. Maybe an object or the story around an object teaches us something. Maybe it has specific geographic associations, or maybe we use it as a status symbol or a signifier of our identity in some way. So the exhibition is loosely arranged by how some of these different kinds of value might or might not typically show up in an art museum exhibition I mean, and ask visitors to think about what kinds of objects are perhaps meeting here. a certain status quo and which require some deeper analysis of perhaps why they're on display. Part of this is playing with the idea of luminosity and luster and light, which I also opened up to interpretation. So luster can refer to a specific materials used in surface decoration like gold or silver plating or gold luster glaze and ceramics, all of which are very visible in the exhibition, which you can see here. But luster can also just refer in kind of common language to a more general sheen or shine. Something lustrous is almost like calling something shiny. So I came to use luster as more of an idea than any specific material. Then I started to think about what other kinds of materials give off lustrous qualities. Maybe it glows when it's lit. Maybe it reflects light in a particular way. So these are things I was thinking about as I looked through our collections at ASU um, when curating this show. The other aspect of the, this exhibition is asking whether there are some materials that have been historically valued more highly than others by art museums. What have been the impacts of how the art world still perceives materiality and process, especially when we're thinking about hierarchies in the field of craft? In the exhibition, this is presented as an exploration and asks more questions than it answers. So I'm basically just gonna walk you through um, very quickly in images around the exhibition space. Um, you won't be able to see everything and I'm so sorry about that, but it will just give you kind of a sense of the show for anybody who has not been able to visit in person. Um, and I will, when we walk through, I will point out the work by Lauren, Sam and Marin. Um, but otherwise I'm just gonna kind of let you look for just a couple of minutes. So you can actually see um, all the artists work on this sort of darker wall in the back. Um, on the left is uh, Lauren's piece. There's sort of two glowing TV monitors that you can see that are displaying the digital artworks. And then Sam and Marin have a collaborative piece just to the right of that, which is the white strands that are hanging from the ceiling. We will have better images of it later. So just to point them out for now. You can see their works a little bit more clearly there. Okay, so now the reason we are here is of course to hear from the artist's perspectives about their work. So let's first get some background and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Now we can all see each other a little bit better. Um, so first let's get some background. Um, and artists, please feel free if you just wanna jump in and we can kind of see how the natural flow goes and we'll just kind of go around and move on once everyone's shared, if that's okay. So if you would each start by introducing yourselves, um, could you just share, first of all, just your names and pronouns if you prefer, um, and then where you're joining us from tonight. Uh, my name is Sam Fresquez. Uh, my name is Marin Alaka, and we are joining from Phoenix and Sam's apartment. <laughs> uh, 
Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Lauren Kalman. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here with Sarah, Sam, and Marin. Um, so cool to see you all. Uh, I'm joining you from my office, classroom, gym, and studio in Detroit, Michigan. I feel like just to be fair, I should also say after that, that I'm also joining you from my living room slash studio slash, you know, plant space slash everything else, library. <laughs> Good for multi-purpose spaces, gotta have them. <laughs> so uh, now I'd love for each of you um, to just describe your the work that's actually up in the exhibition. Um, and we're gonna actually pull up some images of those pieces so that our audience can get a little bit better visual on those. Um, so Lauren, do you mind if we start with you? Is that okay? And perhaps you could just tell us what is the work about? How is it made? And maybe how does it relate to a larger body of work or series that you've been working on? Sure, sure. happy happy to go first. Um, so uh, the title of this body of work is Flourish. It's a series of nine videos and performance, uh, nine video performances and objects. And um, I'll say right off the bat that my body is location for these site specific interactions between objects and the body. Um, the objects that you're seeing are intended to reference bodily fluids uh, expelled during states of repulsion, discomfort, sadness, uh, snot bubbles, sweat, tears, vomit, um, drool. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really interested in um, language and wordplay. So the word flourish has multiple meanings. It describes uh, like the old ornamental comp metal components in the work um, that make up the objects as a decorative swoop or decorative flourish. Um, but flourish also means to thrive. And uh, in this work, I, I am interested in contrasting body, body fluids hinted in uh, the images and objects uh, with maybe ideas of not thriving. Um, the objects kind of indicate states of distress. Uh, the figures in the video are not really thriving, but they're rather kind of ambivalent or even approaching a state of languish. Um, so why the, while the title points to prospering, uh, the imagery kind of contradicts that meaning. Um, so this work, uh, the components in this work, uh, the individual little elements were produced at a residency at uh, the Jacob Bengo factory in Idar Oberstein Jewelry um, at a residency specifically set up for jewelers. Um, this was a factory established in 1873 to produce costume jewelry in steel, copper, and brass. Um, and in its, it did this through its century plus in operation. Um, and primarily they worked with pressed uh, sheet metal um, and they used um, hand carved conforming uh, metal dies to press sheet metal into these, these elaborate shapes. So as a resident at Bengal, I was able to use the dyes and machinery to step on, out my own parts from the historic form. Um, and I am someone that really loves to touch things. So it was just amazing to go through this like 100 year old factory and touch all the old uh, stuff. So, <laughs> you know, I called through all these dyes and, you know, there were a lot of pretty typical vernacular jewelry objects, bows, flowers, girls with dogs, boys with dogs, cherubs, crosses. Yada, yada, that that kind of thing, um, and so you know, just intuitively, I went for you know making a choice to apply these non-objective decorative shapes, um, and eventually I took them back to my studio, and um, but that kind of intuitive gut reaction to these decorative swoops, these flourishes, really became the content of the work. Um, so. I took them back to Detroit with my like amazing assistant Zara Amajdi. Um, we assembled them into these gold-plated metal objects. Um, so to make them, I um, took life casts of my face and micro welded them over a cast. So they fit um, they fit my face exactly, both front and back. So you kind of when they're off the body and displayed as objects, you see the imprint of the face on the other side. Um, so they carry the body when they're not worn and um, they're kind of, the objects themselves are kind of a mix between a jewelry object and uh, bodily fluid. 
So kind of that's kind of the gist of the work. Thank you so much, yeah. Sam and Marin. Um, sorry, first I just wanted to say it was really beautiful work, Lauren, and I really love the phrase they carry their body. When yeah, I was like, I was really thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I almost yeah. want to write that down. Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like that correlates like so much with our with our work. Um, yeah, and like, I mean, I guess what we were interested in, like the installation aspect of the work is of our work specifically is kind of how you have a physical reaction to the work um, when you're in this space. Um, so if you've been in this space, well, we've displayed it a couple of different ways, but when it was up at Lisa study gallery, you could kind of walk amongst the pieces and you could really feel them. Um, and just due to the material of the, I mean, the material is hair, it's synthetic hair. So you just, it feels like this very familiar, you know, extension of the mm -hmm. body in that sense. Um, and I feel like one of my favorite parts of working with hair and of our sculptures is like the presence that they have. And a lot of the times they feel almost like somebody who's turned away from you. And that's something that like, when we were first making them, we were making them in Marin's living room and um, her roommates would always say they look like people like at night yes. <laughs> and they really do have their own um, presence yeah, yeah they have their own presence <laughs> and yeah yeah um, so if you go back to the piece at luster and light um, so this piece like we had mentioned the material is synthetic hair and the gold shimmery cuffs are called braid cuffs. They're just in something you would buy at the beauty supply store that you would adorn um, certain hairstyles like braids or twists um, to kind of accent the hair. So a lot of our materials we buy at the beauty supply store or through, I guess, bulk beauty supply stores online. Um, and working with white hair with this work was new to the work. We had previously mostly worked with darker hair colors, um, blacks and browns, but we were thinking a lot about, or we had started this piece around the time of our birthdays. <laughs> and so we were thinking a lot about, you know, like aging. Yeah. Um, and I think we were both thinking about aging as feminine people and as like femmes and women how it's seen a seen is so different than aging as a masculine person or aging as a man it when you age as a man it's seen as like you're sort of gaining power there's a whole like silver box thing and then <laughs> with, as a woman you're just like society has told us that we lose power as we age and we had had a lot of conversations around just not wanting to buy into that and not wanting to um, I mean, and it comes back around to, to value, like, we don't want to see our later years as less valuable for, for no reason, because I think that we both thought, like, you know, in 10 years, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a better person, like, I'm yeah. not going to be, I'm not losing anything yeah. in age. I have this, like, funny saying that when I turn 30, I'm going to say I'm well marinated, <laughs> just kind of like a play off my name. <laughs> um, so we really, yeah, we we're thinking kind of as, you know, the use of the white hair is just speaking to the, you know, accumulation of wisdom that you gain throughout life and um, yeah. the wisdom that you carry with you. And, and white hair being like a sacred object. Yeah. And just also like thinking about, you know, a lot of so many cultures, like a lot of specifically, you know, indigenous cultures, they really mark, you know, points at your life and like how much wisdom you have gained by like the length of your hair being these markers of like different milestones in your life. Um, so that was kind of, you know, surrounding the conversation. And so the form of this work, um, we had a couple different inspirations, but during the pandemic, um, this like hairstyle just kind of popped up out of, I don't know, maybe it came back from the early 2000s called bubble braids. 
And so a lot of our work as well, we, you know, reference different, I guess, um, trends, um, cultural trends, I would say. Yeah. 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 I think that I also really love, oh, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, I also really love that they kind of like mimic a strand of beads. And I feel like a lot of our work, despite being in like alternative mediums, or like using alternative materials feel very craft-based still. And I think craft is something that's so important to Marin and I both in our collaborative practices and our or, and our individual practices. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, just going off of that, I feel like, I mean, craft has been really important in both of our works and just trying to push back at that narrative of like that line of craft work being not as valuable as, you know, other types of art mediums yeah. essentially yeah and it comes back to that question of like why like you said Sarah like why certain things are seen as valuable and why certain things aren't and yeah and who's been um, associated with with craft yeah traditionally yeah I mean Sam recently we were talking about just looking tracing back the history of craft you know it's a lot of I mean you can trace that history back to I mean, women and specifically like brown and black women. And I feel like that kind of goes into that conversation or maybe can go into that conversation of why is this craft not as valuable? And what are you saying about the history of craft and the people who have been a part of that history? Yeah. The communities that are associated with them mm -hmm. throughout history and still currently. Mm -hmm. Yeah and that their time and our time is as valuable as anyone else's. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's so much of what this exhibition is, is hoping, seeking to point out, you know, trying to draw these relationships between the work and the show and why some might be more valuable than others. Um, so I feel like you all have just started to touch on this, which is really perfect and brings me to the next question. So maybe you can just expand a little bit on what you're already saying, but you know, how, how do you address the idea of value in your work? And I think that you know, all of you in some way, um, though in different ways, kind of address the relationship between identity, bodily adornment um, in some way. Um, what kind of social and cultural values or expectations um, does your work relate to? And you know, what is, what is the message that you hope to convey? And again, Sam and Marin, I feel like you were really just starting to touch on that. If you want to expand a little bit and then we'll hear from Lauren as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, using hair as a medium too is kind of speaking about that and um, I feel like, sorry, wait, yeah, go do you on. have anything to say? Or do you want me to go? Yeah, go on. Okay. <laughs> um, I feel like just personally, I've been thinking about value so much in my life. And I think something in our work that's really interesting in, in conversation with value is like spending so much time at the beauty supply store in this place that is like, not predominantly, but entirely black, black and brown, and then taking those materials into spaces that are entirely white. And like, talk about like pricing differences and like value and um i mean we're like truly elevating the <laughs> status of that yeah this material and yeah just kind of flipping that narrative because i feel like i mean our piece it's mine i bought it is also speaking about like how it it almost feels like an insult when people ask like a black person or like a brown person is that really your hair um and it's like it's none of anyone's business it's ours we bought it <laughs> just kind of adding value to this material that um I mean that like we use to just kind of like adorn our bodies in such a powerful way yeah we made this piece um called Remico door knockers and Remico is the name of the beauty supply store that we usually go to um but they're these door knocker earrings which are the like large bamboo hoop earrings and they're um they were hand carved out of uh, Brazilian gold granite and I mean I think in that piece as well that we're talking so much about like value and what has been valued in this country and who has been valued in this country and why and um 
I don't know, like my favorite part about that piece is that you, um, uh, one of my, my good friends, Sean, um, fabricated it and on the edges of it, you, he like carved in the like seams. Yeah, so and if you're, I guess if you're not familiar with the door knocker hoops, you buy them at the beauty supply store, but they're really just made out of like aluminum that's been like, I don't know if it has just like a gold color coating or plating over it. Um, and so that when you look at them, you can kind of see the seam of them because they're not like these very expensive things, but they're like this object that is used to make us feel like we are elevated. Yeah, are elevated, I guess. Yeah. 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 Lauren, I feel like that that segues really well into some of your your work in metalsmithing and also and also the work in the show. It does segue really well. I'm pretty geeked about this conversation. Um I mean I love that y'all brought up um you know, aging and, and the value of uh, the female or female identifying body as it as it moves, you know, that's something I think very much about in this particular work, um, you know, as I sort of have am entering sort of middle age and mid career and, you know, that sort of, um, you know, veil is pulled away and I'm like, oh, really, this is it? <laughs> this is what it is? And like, you know, that, that sort of, um, you know, interest and excitement of being an, um, a younger, you know, uh, person in a feminine body and then, and, and how that sh like schleps away and what are we left with? And so this, this, the flourish work in this show, I'm really thinking about this idea of projecting, um, an ideal, a collectedness, um, you know, a crafted image, um, particularly through the, you know, prevalence of, you know, social media and internet, especially following the pandemic, when that is the primary mode of communication, um, and sort of the pressures to, to project thriving, um, when in fact, you know, we, we are really not thriving. And so my work really is about that contradiction, um, you know, that, that I'm showing, you um, a clean space, um, a controlled space, and these shiny um, golden things. Um, but the the body and the image is not happy, and you know the the um, you know the objects are kind of grotesque or allude to to grotesque or the body spilling or mis the body misbehaving or being impolite, right? Um, you know we're not supposed to drool in public. Uh, but but they are, <laughs> and so I think a lot about you know the uh, the value we place on facade, and so for me, costume jewelry is also really important in this work. This idea that uh, I mean, there's two ways that I can think of it. You can believe me that these are gold things, and you can think about um, you know the contrast between uh, you know the preciousness of gold and you know the grossness of snot bubbles or drool. Or you can recognize that I'm talking about costume jewelry, which is, um, you know, historically has, has started as pointing to fine jewelry. Of course, it's become its own um, kind of design um, sensibility, but this idea of sort of aspirational objects, um, affordable, aspirational, and facade. Um, and so in some way, the jewelry becomes like a second mask. This idea of performing oneself and then it becomes a second layer of performance um, or facade. So yeah, those are some of the things I think about, I guess, with value uh, in my work. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'm wondering, um, how did you all get started working in the materials? So I think that we've kind of been talking about already how the materials address the ideas that you're working with, but I'm wondering like, what is the sort of story for you and we've heard some about the ideas but then how did you actually say okay like this is this is the material i think is going to be the best to like pursue this idea or did it happen in a different way how did that happen for you i guess um we can start sarah <laughs> um so i mean sam and i been working we started working collaboratively during our undergrad at ASU um, and 
we were just putting this together. <laughs> um, and so I feel like we, you know, at the time Sam was doing an artist residency and she had this opportunity and like a stipend to create new work. And so she invited me um, to work collaboratively with her again. And so this was our second piece. And so for us to work collaboratively, it's really important that we are kind of coming together like equally and that we both see ourselves in the work and see ourselves collaboratively collaboratively together in the work. And so the use of hair and it's mine I bought it just felt like this natural thing that we related to. Um, I was, you know, kind of starting to get my hair braided more often. And then Sam like every other day like had these long like Yankee ponytails <laughs> <laughs> from the beauty supply store. And so it just felt like this material that we could both relate to and just expand on conversations about yeah. um, forms of adornment for both of our, I guess, backgrounds um, culturally and identity wise. Yeah. Yeah. We had been like really falling in love with artists like Sonia Clark and uh, Tanya Aguniga and other people who had used hair in these amazing ways. and that was a lot of a part of our conversations as well as like just being friends and talking about our hair a lot <laughs> and so it, it felt like a natural thing and also felt like a significant um material yeah felt like this ritual that we both like just understood <laughs> yeah that's awesome thank you Lauren? Sure. Well, um, I mean, I, so my position with my material, I think, started with in a much less sort of conceptual or intellectual way. I was, I went to school to be a, a studio jeweler. I was trained in, in, in jewelry and metalsmithing, and I thought I was going to make, you know, wearable objects. And, you know, I think really quickly, I got sort of disenfranchised with that, you know, sort of um, you know, making objects for a high-end kind of commodity market was just not super exciting. I know the art world is like deeply embedded in in uh, capitalism, but but there was something about that really direct line that this was a luxury object, and and I became way more interested in ideas of adornment and what it means to adorn the body, how we use adornment as a, a vehicle to project, um, you know, social signifiers. Uh, identity, political um, affiliations, cultural affiliations, and I, I think, I think really strongly that that things like fashion adornment, um, you know, speak so much more pow powerfully than objects in, in a museum. You know that that we um, communicate on a daily basis through what we wear and how we choose to adorn our bodies. And so my work, while it does is gallery work, it it kind of points back to that vernacular, that that how we use objects in in um, in our lived uh, experiences as a vehicle for communication. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty traditionally trained in that way, so I have all the teeny tiny skills. Um, I also have a background in in foundry and figurative work, so the body is really um, kind of a natural thing for me um, to work with, and I I uh, have. A master's degree in art and technology, which is how I ended up holding in video and um, digital imaging into my work. So it's kind of just this cocktail of experiences, um, you know, and that snowball keeps rolling. So as I, as I, you know, teach, I just taught ceramics and now I'm all about making ceramic objects. Um, you know, so as I have these experiences that kind of get bound up in, into my practice. Yeah, and I like shiny stuff. A lot. So that's the, the jewelry things are really, really uh, jewelry and stones. Super fun for me. Thank you so much. I uh, just I love this conversation. And, you know, I've just been so like embedded in these ideas for the last, you know, 12 months. And it's so lovely to hear from from all of you um, about your thoughts. 
So I wanted to also turn to something um, that's just kind of fun and not necessarily specifically related to your work. Um, so I asked you all before to think about maybe an object that was special to you. And it does not have to be an art object. It can be anything, um, but maybe something that was um, formative for you in deciding that you wanted to be an artist, or maybe it's unrelated and it's just something that's really special to you. Um, and I think of doing this as like a way to get to know people sometimes because I work in objects and because we're such visual people. Um, and I think it can be really telling. But the second part I kind of want to add to that, um, thinking about this show is, do you think that that object um, would be, could be ever in an art museum and why? Did you think of an object? <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of, okay, so I, the first thing I thought of actually was um, when I was growing up, my grandma owned a paper supply store. And um, I have this like very vivid memory of leaving a bunch of paper together and being like, like I must've been like five or something. Okay. And, <laughs> and I like thought that I had invented weaving. And I was like, wow, I am. <laughs> I really haven't. And then my grandma being like, oh no, this is like a thing. And then in like reflecting on that, kind of feeling like really connected to every other person who just intuitively wove something together and being like, all of these people existed across time and space <laughs> and had the urge to do this. And I felt like weirdly connected to them as makers. And I feel like it's that same urge that like, keeps us going it's like oh this is interesting like what would that look like what would that feel like yeah mm -hmm. I'm still trying to think I mean I feel like I feel like well this conversation and speaking about jewelry um since Lauren has been speaking about it has kind of just reminded me of like as a young kid um my mom had this huge jewelry collection um, and so I would always go in and try on her different gold jewelry or silver jewelry. And I feel like I had never thought about just my connection to adornment in that sense and like the ritual of getting yourself, like presenting yourself until I guess later during my undergrad, I started working um, in small metals and jewelry and creating um, different forms of adornment. And um, and also kind of conceptually pushing what jewelry can convey. And so I, you know, I would created some work over the pandemic that was like tracing the history of like, the history of like the Mama Benz figure, which is like, a, it's basically the story in West Africa during, I think during like the 60s, uh, Mama Benz was this term that was coined for women who, you know, Nigerian women who became wealthy um, trading textiles. Um, and so with that wealth, they bought Mercedes Benz cars. <laughs> and so, which I thought was really interesting because they're really pushing like, you know, gender norms and like this idea of like women couldn't be entrepreneurs, but then they were entrepreneurs. Um, and my, my dad's Nigerian. So I was, you know, always been really interested in like different forms of adornment within, um, Yoruba cultures. Um, so I feel like object wise jewelry has, you know, just woven through my life in a lot of ways. And I feel really connected to, um, wearing jewelry. And I was creating jewelry for a while during the pandemic. Um, I think, yeah, I feel like that's, that's kind of my object <laughs> for objects and thinking about like heirlooms as well. And like these jewelry pieces that have been passed down through generations and like holding on to um, our histories. Do you have a specific piece of jewelry? Do you have a specific piece? Do you have a favorite? Um, I, I don't know if I have a favorite because I go through cycles of pieces, but... <laughs> So my, my follow-up question to that is, do you think that your objects would be ever in a museum? Do you think that you could see them in a museum or like what purpose would they have? That kind of thing. 
Hmm. And it doesn't have to be yours in particular because you could be like, no, I would never give it to a museum. But like, you know, what, what purpose could it have or could you see it in that environment? Yeah, I mean, I think we see jewelry and weaving, like textiles. Yeah, and textiles and museum environments. I think it also goes back to like these objects being related to craft. So there's a little like yeah. sometimes separated separated yeah <laughs> I went to a, a craft museum in San Diego for the first time I had never been to a craft museum and I went recently and I feel like that was just amazing to see craft like really not being separated from the rest of everything to be like this is conceptual work this is valuable and has always been valuable and mm -hmm. um yeah yeah I could see both of our pieces being yeah there. I also really like, uh, Marin, that you brought up the idea of like the heirloom, you know, and what what kind of value that has. And, and that's something I've done with the exhibition too. Like one of the examples I love to refer to is this huge braided rug that to my knowledge has, you know, been in the collection for several decades, but has never been on display. Um, and I, I sort of justified bringing it out for multiple reasons, but one of them is because it has murex in it, which if you're not familiar is like a sort of a synthetic um, thread that was usually like plated in gold or silver or something like that. Um, it was really popular like mid-century. And so it has these tiny, you know, it's really beat up. It's obviously been used. And, you know, we had this whole con conversation when I was pulling it out of like, well, it's really dirty, dirty you know, it, it really needs to be cleaned. I just don't know if we can actually have it on display. And I was like, it's perfect. You know, <laughs> this is exactly what I'm talking about is that, you know, we don't, because it's dirty or because it was actually utilized in somebody's home, you know, it's like, we don't, we see it in a different light and does it belong then in an art museum um, and so that's kind of like the idea that I'm getting at with this like sort of object game a little bit but I, I really love that that you brought that kind of thing up and you know what value does that hold to somebody else seeing it in a museum and I think that can be kind of controversial like that can be bad sometimes you know it can be really bad um, so but you know when is it okay and when is it not is I think a, another conversation but I just love that the sort of idea of the heirloom and that being something really special um, that came up. Yeah, this conversation just like reminded me of this memory when I think you were there when we met Sonia Clark mm -hmm. and she, oh. yeah, and I was telling her about, you know, some of the jewelry work I was making and how I didn't at the time really consider it fine art. And I remember she said, she was like, it's art if you say it is. And I feel like just hearing it from her and like someone who I'd always like, just really admired like yeah. changed my perspective on you know yeah how I was viewed the work that I was making I've been having this phrase that I like repeat to myself a lot that's been one of my like mantras recently is like things have value because we give them value and like just because what somebody who has money or power or status um because they perceive something as valuable that like doesn't make it valuable. Like I'm allowed to define what valuable is to me. And I feel like that's like what keeps me making work is like trying to answer that question. And um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Things have value because we give them value. <laughs> Thanks. Lauren, did you have something that you wanted to share? Oh man, these are like my least favorite question. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay um I'm a terrible narrative storyteller is why uh, but I did want to say like Sam I love your story about how you thought you invented weaving because I think you invented weaving like I think you had, like every little kid that figures that out like they that's re that's inventing weaving I think it's so kind of phenomenal it's such an innate human thing to do um I love that story. It's terrific. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I don't really have a specific story. Um, like I said, I'm not really a good narrative storyteller, but I w well, I will, will say that I'm a toucher. Like I'm a very tactile human um, and I'm a collector of things. Um, you know, my father is that way as well as was my mother. They, you know, they, they collected specifically craft objects. Um, 
And so we kind of lived in a house full of things. Um, my my Bar? mother was a commercial we're photographer. Not gonna, my, we're going to zoom at 10. <laughs> my father was an industrial designer. So they were they were in the commercial arts, um, but very much interested in in kind of design objects. And so, you know, I have also, I, when I travel, I have, I collect souvenirs, um, high and low, you know, fine craft and also kitsch and plastic, you know, mass manufactured plastic. I love glow in the dark Madonnas. Like that's, that's one of my favorite uh, collection items. Um, and I, I think for me, there's something something about an object and holding an object that tactility that triggers memory like much like scent triggers memory in in a different way that an image does an image tells a story that is very static you know we see the people in it we see the place and that locks it into a particular moment and there's something about holding an object um or smelling a smell or hearing a sound that can trigger kind of um a tactile or emotive response to me. And so I think, it, I, you know, very, I'm very much interested in, in how objects work in that way, how they resonate bodily in a way that's very different than making an image or, you know, watching a video. Um, you know, and so in that way, like, I think, I know, I mean, as we know, museums are, are both fantastic resources and hugely problematic um, because they're engaged in, in framing objects through particular lenses um you know and i think um you know the 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 thought the ideas of like the ethnographic museum the idea of taking something that is from lived culture isolating it putting it behind a case taking it out of context removing it from its meaning removing it from touch which is such an important part of understanding the object you know <laughs> i think a lot is is lost in that translation um you know, that it becomes, yeah, I don't know. So I think, I think for me, it's really hard to sometimes imagine craft-based objects. And I say that really broadly, you know, I think about, you know, studio craft movements, um, but I'm also thinking about craft and kitsch, you know, objects, these sort of mass produced objects that we use to decorate our, our homes. Like, you know, for me, I'm interested in both the, the high and the low, you know, the, I think, you know, I think there's something like amazing about um, vernacular objects that I'm that I'm really personally drawn to, um, but that they don't exist well in a museum. You know, they they become kind of isolated and sterile. Yeah, I think that's such an important conversation to bring up as well because that that is exactly what starts happening. You know, when you start talking about daily kind of lived experience, you know, thinking about who something belonged to and what life has it had before. Um, exactly with like the ethnographic or the sort of anthropological kind of museum experience being a whole different different thing and and being highly problematic in in many cases so i'm i'm really glad you brought that up as well So I think that um, unless Lauren or Sam or Maren, if you have anything else to add, we can probably open up to our audience if that's okay. Um, if anyone has questions for the artists that you would like to ask, um, you're more than welcome to just unmute yourself and speak up if you would like. Um, but there also is the chat feature and you're more than welcome to type your questions in um, and we can kind of narrate them for you if you'd like. Um, and I think if you do that, if you use the chat feature, perhaps you can just say who your question is for, if there's someone particular in mind, or you can say it's for everyone to answer. So I can get things started if no one, I have plenty more questions. <laughs> um, but I'm wondering, so you all have talked about, um, we've sort of talked about like the value of different materials and how that plays into your work. But I'm wondering if, um, Lauren, maybe this would be more um, something that you would have thought about, you know, long as you were learning metalsmithing. But, you know, did you ever think when you were going into what you're making, 
um, like the sort of status of the material that you were using? Or was it just more like, okay, I have this concept. I want to make sure that it happens. Um, or is that just not a concern and we should move on from that? The status of the material, but is that specific? Yeah, like, the you know, because we're kind of like talking about this like sort of hierarchy of value and like, does that play a role into like why you have or have not chosen to use a particular material? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I almost exclusively work with gold. Um, it's all gold, gold plated though. Um, so it's all, it's all fake. Um, but I am very much alluding to um, sort of social constructed value, you know, the, like mainstream valued objects like that, that, that is very much the intention. Um, <laughs> and, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about preciousness and how, how value is con like constructed and comes about, um, you know, and that comes from, you know, a lot of ways, um, you know, from, from monetary value to, you know, sort of symbolic value in gold that has, you know, this sort of, um, you know, really amazing, um, magical, cultural, you know, medicinal value across the world and in, in, in different ways and different meanings. But I think there's something about that material and it's because it doesn't, uh, corrode, right? It doesn't tarnish. It doesn't. Um, it can, you know, it doesn't change over time unless it's like smashed. But it still remains, you know, yellow and shiny. And and there's something kind of that it's like imbued with this kind of mythology and magic as a material. And so yeah, that 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 was how I started working uh, working with it. Thanks. Sam and Marin, do you want to answer that? Julio also has another question, if, if you don't. Yeah, what's Julio's question? So Julio asked to all of you, what are you excited about working on next? Um, I'm like finishing up some work right now, but I think after a slight break from that. I'm like <laughs> really, really excited um, to start working on Marin and I's collaborative work again. Uh, we have a show in the fall at the Phoenix Art Museum and we're gonna be coming back to our hair work, which will be really nice. And we've been like getting larger and larger with our scale and I'm just really excited to yeah. revisit it. Yeah, I'm really excited to be in the studio more consistently. <laughs> Yeah, it's nice yeah. to have like joint studio days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we share a studio space. So sometimes even when we're working on separate projects, we're in there together, but it's really fun when we're working, working together. Yeah, working together on our new work. So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren, do you have anything exciting coming up? Oh boy. Yeah, I mean, I've got a, a lot of a lot of things cooking. I think um, some I'm very excited about, some I'm <laughs> dreading, um, but I think mean, that's the nature of making things. Um, but I'm really excited. I've taught myself to throw over um, you know, the past couple of years, partially because I'm teaching, I taught uh, ceramics, filling in for a colleague on sabbatical and partially, and then it just was like, oh, I really like this. It's like, meditative and really kind of basic engineering and very physical um and it it was really nice to reconnect um with my studio practice which had been really kind of forced over the pandemic like it was it it has been hard to be in the studio because um you know basically i think we all a lot of us feel really crummy or have felt really crummy and, and with the you know i teach full-time the obligations of um zoom teaching and transitioning to that format so anyways it was nice to be back in the studio but i got to thinking about um you know the vessel you know as a second body and uh using my body to um kind of cradle or hold these vessels and um in that cradling and holding they become distorted and and some of them are quite quite large um you know, right now I'm working on a couple two feet, two, two foot tall vessels. Um, this idea of both coddling and smothering 
you know, holding so tightly that you, you, you destroy the thing that you love. I think, I think this idea of like wanting connection, I wasn't thinking about the pandemic and isolation when I started, but like, as I kind of look back at what I'm doing, it's very much about this idea of, of a proxy for human contact um, and desire to hold and hold on to and not let go. Um, and, and the imprint we leave on something when we're no longer there. So that I'm really like really geeked about this work. And right now I'm doing small performances, um, you know, in my home myself, and I'm looking at planning a much larger scale performance with other, um, you know, participants, bodies, friends, performers, you know, co-conspirators, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, but throwing pots is really fun. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Does anybody else have questions? We have about two minutes left. If not, then I think we can call it. Andrea? Hi, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Sarah and all the artists. Um, so there's just a question popped up in the chat. So the exhibition is on display currently at um, the Ceramics Research Center at the ASU Art Museum. It is open Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And you can stop by any time to come and see their work. But I just wanna thank you for all for such a wonderful and interesting talk. I've learned so much. And I look forward to seeing what um, all of you do next. Thank you all so much for joining us. Yeah, Thanks, thank you everybody. for having us. <laughs>